Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Yongbek, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to visit you guys here. Uh, yeah, so today I'll be talking about um, some new kinds of quantum criticality that can arise in uh, mixed states of quantum systems. And in, in making a talk, I always struggle with uh, coming up with good images, especially for title slides. So this time I took the easy way out and just asked AI to generate two images based on these four words. <laughs> and this, this is what you get. Uh, and I, I was tempted to ask uh, Chat GPT to generate the rest of the whole presentation, but uh, maybe maybe next time. Okay, great. So yeah, well, let's begin with something that's uh, I think very dear to the hearts of uh, especially condensed matter, quantum matter theorists, and that's long range entangled matter, right? So this is basically quantum matter that's very far from our our everyday classical reality of product like states. And hence, uh, one of the most interesting phases of matter. Um, so, so one prime example of long-range entangled states are, are quantum critical states. These are states that can occur at phase transitions between different phases of matter, say between uh, ferromagnets, paramagnets. And indeed, these are, are long-range entangled. They have quantum correlations at all length scales. Right? Uh, another prime example of long-range entangled matter is uh, topological order. So unlike trivial, unlike more trivial phases of matter like ferromagnets, uh, these have no local order parameter, and instead one needs uh, more subtle notions to describe them. Uh, so, for example, these topological order have uh, quasi-particle-like excitations that are called anions, uh, which can be neither bosons nor fermions, and these have uh, very interesting applications for things like topological quantum computing, uh, for example. So um, due to all these interesting properties of long-range entangled phases, uh, these states are, are highly sought after in real materials and experiments. And until very recently, uh, you know, trying to realize these interesting states um, tended to be exclusively in the domain of solid state materials, right? We wanted to find real materials which realize either quantum criticality or topological order, spin liquids, et cetera. Uh, however, recently, as you all probably know, there's been a lot of exciting developments uh, in the field of um, quantum simulation and quantum computing. So, yeah, I think uh, most of this audience is familiar with many of these different approaches toward realizing um, systems of artificial qubits that are highly controllable. You can realize uh, unitary gates, you can do single side measurements, and, and much more. So these, these highly controllable um, quantum platforms provide uh, a relatively new context for realizing long-range entangled states. Now you can, you know, try to literally build up the long-range entangled state as if you're you're carrying out some instruction set in, in, in with Lego building blocks, right? You start out from the product state, and you can literally try to apply gates to construct these interesting uh, states in quantum matter. And indeed, there's been uh, a lot of recent progress uh, precisely re realizing this program. So, uh, for example, in uh, systems of uh, Rydberg atom arrays and uh, superducting qubits, um, people have successfully realized um, what look like homologically ordered uh, phases of matter. Okay. Um, however, one has to keep in mind that these are still open quantum systems, right? Uh, we, we still have to struggle against coupling to the environment, noise, decoherence. And so this really begs the question, uh, um, how do we think of long-range entanglement in, in mixed states, right? Th these are, after all, mixed states being achieved in, you know, a realistic experiment, right? So uh, how do we characterize long-range entanglement in mixed states? Uh, and how do we realize non-trivial instances of long range entangled mixed states? So um, at first glance, this might seem you know, quite, quite difficult. The mixed states that we're most familiar with are, are thermal states, right? Like equilibrium Gibbs states of local Hamiltonians, right? And these typically uh, do not have long range quantum correlations. Usually finite temperature is just bad news for any non-trivial quantumness, right? Uh, and, and indeed, um, if you start off with a quantum critical system and you turn on finite temperature, then these long range correlations I mentioned are now cut off by, by a thermal length scale. Right? And similarly, for regarding topological order, uh, if you turn on finite temperature, then unless you're in four dimensions, at least so far, 
uh, there is no finite temperature topological order. Okay. So it's clear that uh, equilibrium Gibbs states um, may, may not be the best place to look. We really want to find a highly non equilibrium setting uh, to see any instances of non trivial long range tangled mixed states. Yes. What's special about deep form? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So deep, so, so here, I guess I have in mind specifically a, a Tor code model of topological order in which in four dimensions, you can have uh, basically um, uh, instead of point like any on excitations, you can have loop like excitations only, right? And it turns out at finite temperature, it's much harder to pro proliferate these loop like excitations. So the topological order is stable. Yeah. Okay, so it's clear that we need some uh, some highly non-equilibrium setting to get any non-trivial mixed states. And so we want to consider um, a setting of highly controllable open quantum systems. So quantum systems in which the coupling to the environment doesn't lead to trivial thermalization, but now you can control the interface with the environment very carefully in different ways. Okay. And as usual, we can draw inspiration from uh, quantum error correction and fault tolerance because you know, there for decades, they've been considering a very closely related problem of how do you stabilize uh, quantum information coherently in a noisy environment, right? This is basically hand in hand with this question of uh, stabilizing long range entanglement in an open quantum system. Okay. So there, uh, the approach for, for fault tolerance is uh, usually active error correction. So in active error correction, uh, you basically carry out um, measurements to, to have a best guess of where the errors occurred. And then based on the measurement outcomes, uh, you apply some feedback, you apply some corrective unitaries uh, to correct those, those errors. Okay. So this is the, the, the basic spirit of active error correction. You apply measurements, get some knowledge of, of the errors, and then you apply feedback based on the measurement outcomes to, to correct them. Okay. And fault tolerance might still be uh, several years away. However, it's it's you know one of the holy grails for, for quantum computing, right? So, so many of these quantum hardware platforms uh, already have or are developing the capability to do what's called these mid-circuit measurements. So measurements along with unitaries. Uh, that, that you don't just do at the end of a protocol, you can do them dynamically. Okay. So many of these quantum hardwares already have this uh, mid-circuit measurement capability. And so this, this begs the question, even before we reach you know, full-fledged fault-tolerant quantum computing, uh, can we use these type of operations in some interesting way uh, to realize uh, some interesting mixed states? Okay. So this will be uh, uh, one of the motivations for the first part of this talk. Uh, so this is work in progress with uh, a postdoc at Perimeter, Peter um, Sagar Vijay, who's a faculty member at Santa Barbara, and his student uh, Ziha Zeng. So in, in this first part of the talk, we will use precisely this type of operation of uh, measurements followed by feedback uh, to convert, to efficiently convert um, simple pure states into non-trivial long-range ordered or even critical mixed states. Okay, so one example I'll present is uh, some protocols for converting um, symmetry protected topological states or SVT states into uh, GHZ or topological order uh, via measurement and feedback. I'll probably focus on, on this GHZ order more in, in the interest of time. And furthermore, um, I'll try to show some examples in which we can also use measurement feedback to convert simple free fermion states, such as a, a churn insulator, uh, into um, critical spin systems. So, so mixed states of spin systems with algebraically decaying uh, correlation functions. Okay. And in the second part, I'll talk about uh, a somewhat different approach for, re for realizing uh, um, interesting quantum critical behavior in mixed states. Now, in, instead of starting out with simple pure states, I'll start out with uh, already non-trivial pure states, so quantum critical pure states. And then basically we were interested in asking uh, how does such long range entanglement in pure states survive under local decoherence, under some simple noise channels? Uh, does the local decoherence just kill the long range entanglement? 
Does it uh, does it um, preserve it? Does it alter it in an interesting way? And as you'll see, there'll be concrete examples of, of all of the above uh, options. Okay. So using this different route, we'll also be able to achieve some uh, critical mixed states. So more, more specifically, I'll show you that uh, we can define in a precise sense, uh, renormalization group flows or RG flows uh, between different quantum channels. And these RG flows will actually determine the entanglement structure of the resulting mixed states. Uh, one um, question we're very interested in is how quantum are these resulting mixed states? And these, these RG flows will help us answer that question. And I should point out that there was a, a related work from uh, Zhang Yan and Senke at Santa Barbara and Cha Ming at Cornell. Uh, in which they consider a related question of uh, decohered quantum criticality, although they focus on uh, very different aspects of the problem. So I encourage you to also check out that reference. Okay, so let's uh, jump right into the, the, the first part. So again, just to remind you, in the first part, we want to consider uh, this type of operation that I'll call local adaptive uh, quantum circuit. So a local adaptive circuit consists of both uh, local unitary gates uh, local measurements, and most importantly, uh, the ability to process the measurement outcomes and decide what to do later uh, at, at a later time step in the circuit. Okay. So hence the name adaptive. Based on the measurement outcomes, you can decide what unitaries, what measurements to apply uh, later in time. Okay. And the, the motivation um, for why we and many other people uh, consider such local adaptive circuits is because they allow you to um, shortcut the preparation of long range entangled state, right? So if you have a quantum circuit that consists of purely local unitary gates, then there's a, a Lieb Robinson bound which restricts how quickly that local unitary circuit can establish long range correlation, right? So it turns out that with a with a local unitary circuit, um, you need depth or time uh, of order system size to prepare any long range entangled state, like a quantum critical point or topological order. Um, however, the Lee Robinson bound uh, assumes you know local unitary evolution, right? And so, with with local measurements and non-local classical communication, basically the ability to uh, take all this classical data and decide what to do uh, at a future time slice, this setting is beyond Lee Robinson, and this is why local adaptive circuits are actually able to prepare long-range entangled states like topological order in order one time that's independent of the system size okay sorry yeah so, uh, what is, what, what's the consequence of the local measurement here so aren't you unentangled after you do the local measurement yeah that, that's that's right that's a good question so uh yeah so i i didn't mention that um this shaded dots in the background are, are meant to indicate uh ancilla qubits Okay, so we'll allow coupling to ancilla degrees of freedom. We 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 want uh, basically an order one overhead of ancilla, so like maybe one or two per physical degree of freedom. So we're allowed to bring in those ancillas, couple them with unitaries, measure the ancillas, etc. Yeah, yeah. So now you can have a non-trivial state remaining if you're just measuring ancillas. Right? Yeah. Thanks for the question. So in, in all these previous works. Um, uh, all these groups started out with short range entangled peer states, like say a, a trivial product state, and arrived at uh, long range entangled peer states. Okay, and this is pretty um, fine tuned. So here, basically, we we started with some ideal fixed point state with zero correlation length, and and due to that you know that uh, restrictive structure, uh, we arrive at a particular peer state that's long range entangled. So all these local measurements are producing. A bunch of trajectories of pure states and the feedback the the corrective unitaries are able to converge all those measurement trajectories back into a single target pure state uh that's uh, albeit long range entangled okay so we, we go from pure state to pure state but this is kind of a very fine-tuned setting and so in general this local adaptive circuit will convert uh pure state to, to mixed state and so we, we would like a, a more general formalism to describe this behavior. Okay. So, so this is the, the slightly more uh, general picture of what we like to consider. So again, we start out with a, a, a pure state psi naught that's defined on uh, a system with say two types of degrees of freedom, A and B. 
these can be, uh, as you see, as, as you all see, this can be both, uh, you know, sub lattice degrees of freedom or spin and charge. It can be some extensive partitioning of your of your system. Okay. And uh, so as before, we'll do, uh, we'll perform local measurements on the A degrees of freedom, and then we'll feed uh, the measurement outcomes into some uh, simple classical processing to decide what to do uh, later on the B degrees of freedom. So what, what unitaries to apply on the B degrees of freedom, okay? And we wanna consider this as a quantum channel uh, that converts the pure state psi naught into uh, the state supported on the B degrees of freedom, which will in general be a, a mixed state. So we're, we're not interested in what happens to the A after all this, because the A's are, are measured out and typically trivial. Okay, so we want to view this as a quantum channel from psi naught to uh, the reduced density matrix on B, row B. And it turns out that we can uh, we can think of row B as basically tracing out A after applying a big unitary on psi naught. And this big unitary on psi naught is some control unitary. Okay, so it's basically a, a control unitary described by uh, projection, like sum over all outcomes of the projection operator onto the outcome, followed by the feedback you perform on B, uh, depending on that outcome. Okay. So, yeah, so it's basically uh, uh, this row B has a, oh, sorry, yeah, I got a little bit ahead of myself. So, yeah, okay, so, so yeah, I want you to think of row B as arising from uh, doing a control unitary on the whole state and then tracing out A. Okay. So on, on, on general grounds to convert from short range to long range entanglement, uh, this control unitary cannot be a local finite depth circuit, right? Precisely for the reason I mentioned earlier that for a local finite depth circuit, uh, there's a Lee Robinson bound that limits the generation of long range correlation. Okay, so this, this control unitary will not be simple. It will not be local finite depth, uh, however, the key is that we're kind of absorbing all the complexity into local quantum operations, these local measurements, local unitaries, uh, but we have this non-local classical communication. So we have the ability to use all the classical data everywhere to decide what to do locally. Okay. So all the complexity absor is absorbed into this non-local classicality. And this is, again, kind of uh, experimentally motivated, right? Because the, the quantum operations are the, the hard part. The classical processing we like to think is the is the easy part of quantum computing. Okay, so uh, right, so again, again, just to, just to emphasize, we like to view this channel as going from psi naught to rho b. Uh, however, it will be useful to think of the the purification of rho b, which is just uh, this control unitary applied to the full system. Okay, so this u psi naught is precisely a a purification for rho b. Okay. And the parent Hamiltonian for this purification is just given by conjugating the parent Hamiltonian of the original pure state by this uh, control unitary. Okay. So is the entire process is pure unitary? Uh, no, no. So so we, we've, we've done, right. So, so uh, we, we've done measurement and feedback. So the, the entire process is, is not unitary. However, we can think of rho b as coming from a pure state that's obtained by applying a unitary to the original pure state. Okay. So, 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 well, right, so, so we, we, we perform uh, local measurements and feedback, which will, which ultimately will result in, in a mixed state right. on both a and b. Right, so so we, we go from a, a physically we go from a uh, pure state on the entire system to a mixed state on the entire system, which cannot be unitary. However, I'm saying we're only interested in the, the in the channel from the pure state to row B to to the reduced density matrix on B. Okay, and I'm saying that that row B has a purification has a natural purification that's just purified by A. And that purification comes from applying a unitary to the pure state. So, so in other words, it, it can be equally well carried out 
by a big control unitary on the original computer state and then tracing out a yeah usually complex right, right, right. like to, to carry out that unitary is probably you know pretty hard and so this measurement and feedback is like a natural way to to shortcut that right right yeah well isn't it the case that control unitaries are very difficult to realize experimentally yeah yeah Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. We're, we're really saying we want to realize this, right? This, this is a, a theoretical way to think about the physical process of measurement and feedback. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. So more specifically, we want to convert um, some type of hidden or non-local order in this initial peer state uh, into some genuine long-range order in the resulting mixed state on B. Uh, by doing this type of measurement and feedback. And I'll, I'll show you a concrete example very shortly. So in, in, in this framework, uh, all we rely on is some hidden order in the initial peer state. If it's there, then we're guaranteed to have uh, a long range order in the mixed state. And hence this, this convertibility to long range order is really a property of an entire phase of the initial state. It's a pretty robust property of the, the initial state. And uh, there were some related works um, from Santa Barbara, Harvard. Uh, and so in, in, in these works, they consider a, a similar setup of measurement followed by uh, classical post-processing. OK. Uh, but in general, um, in general, there can be some overlap between classical post-processing and unitary feedback. Uh, but one doesn't necessarily include the other. Right, like for example, many types of classical post-processing cannot be realized by simple uh, local unitary feedback, and also the the examples we will consider will be will be very different than in in these papers. Okay, so let's just begin with an explicit uh, toy model. Okay, so we want to consider a one D system uh, of qubits with two sublattices A and B, and we want to consider a one uh, D cluster state. Um, symmetry protected topological state. So um, specifically, we want to consider the ground state of this uh, interacting Hamiltonian consisting of uh, interactions of ZXZ for every three neighboring qubits. Okay. So this is a, uh, the ground state of this Hamiltonian is a non-trivial uh, SPT protected by two global symmetries, two Ising symmetries on each uh, sublattice on A and on B. One way to see why this is a non-trivial SPT state is to look at um, a string order parameter. So if, if one uh, considers an operator in which uh, Zs are applied at the endpoints on the B sublattice, and then you also multiply by all the Xs on the A sublattice in between, uh, this constitutes a, a string order parameter. And one can easily check that the ground state of this Hamiltonian has string order parameter uh, one. Okay. Basically, yeah, this is a completely commuting model. So all these um, all these operators take value one in the ground state. So you can multiply them head to tail. The Zs in the middle cancel out. So you end up with this type of string operator that uh, uh, takes value one. Okay, so this is one way to see why this is a, a non-trivial SPT. So this is the, the, the pure state we begin with, with hidden order. And now we want to convert this into genuine long range order. Okay. And yeah, so 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 far this is you know not our work at all. This dates all the way back to uh, Briegel and and Rosendorf in very early days. So uh, there, there's a simple way to convert this into genuine long range order on B, and basically we want to turn this uh, string of X operators into numbers, right? We just want to convert those operators into numbers, and then the string will just become the endpoint, the the, the two point operator that we want. Okay, so basically what we do is we measure uh, all the A sites um, in the X direction. So now we get uh, some number like plus or minus one for this, the middle of the string. And then now uh, we want to get rid of that ambiguity of plus or minus one by doing uh, unitary feedback, right? So more, more physically measuring X on the A sites tells you about the, the domain wall information for neighboring B sites, okay? So by, by measuring X, you, you know about the, the relative Z orientation for, uh, for B sites far apart. So more, more specifically, we, we take all that uh, measurement outcome for, for the X measurements. And then based on that, we decide whether or not we need to flip a given 
qubit on the B side or not. Uh, so, so the goal is to get some long range ZZ uh, ferromagnetic order. Okay. Yeah, so concretely we apply this, uh, this unitary feedback, which again is simple quantumly, it's just uh, a single qubit flip, but it depends non-locally, it depends on all the measurement information uh, coming from these X measurements. Okay. So we do measurement and feedback, and uh, you can easily convince yourself that at the end of the day, we get a pure uh, GHZ state, all up plus all down on the B system after measurement. Okay. So again, here it's a, it's a very restrictive setting. We start with a, a fixed point, zero correlation length state, and measurement and feedback can, converts it into a single pure GHZ state with long range order. Okay, yes. Hi, sorry yeah the initial state is the ground state of this spt hamiltonian so it's a it's a non-trivial spt state uh with this hidden order okay can you give me a concise picture into like does it mean like Locally access or like yeah, 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 thanks. So, so, so the, the, we're, we're dealing with the ground state of the Hamiltonian. All these operators in the Hamiltonian commute. So the ground state is completely specified by fixing all these ZXZs to be one. It's what's called the stabilizer state in which all these stabilizers take value one. So in, in, indeed, uh, all the X, all the X operators on B is uh, completely correlated with the ZZ nearby, right? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this reminds me of the fusion gate. You know, uh, you have two entangled states. You make two curious sort of fusion, and you have a long chain of entangled states on two smaller entangled states. Is this something similar going on here? Um, sorry, I'm not sure I understood the the fusion. What what what, what operation? Fusion gate helps you to like create longer chains of entangled states. Let's say if you have like n qubit entangled states on one side and qubit on the other, you measure two qubits, now you have two n minus one. Right. Uh, qubit entangled states. Yeah, I, I, think, I think eventually all these can be probably related to each other because whether or not you're measuring single qubit or, or two qubit for fusion, uh, depends on whether or not you want to apply a unitary before the measurement or not. You can probably convert Single qubit into two qubit measurements by applying some simple unitary. So I, th I think that I think they're all related. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, like the initial ground state of the SPT, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, does it also have a long range correlation? No, no. Okay. Yeah. Th thanks for the good point. So again, the, the the rules of the game here is we want to start with a simple pure state that can be prepared with a finite depth circuit, and indeed, uh, this hidden string order is not an obstruction to preparing it with a short depth circuit. So, so indeed, preparing the cluster state is easy. You just apply some uh, control phase gates on a product state, like one layer of control phase gates. So it's easy to prepare. And then this pretty simple measurement feedback can convert it into genuine long range order. Yeah. OK, yeah, thanks. Right, so so the 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 point I want to make is that this you know this again is the ideal setting of a pure state to pure state because we're dealing with a fixed point state. So so now we want to consider uh, um, you know the, the more general setting of what if you perturb away from this uh, fixed point state, right? So uh, we can add to the ideal cluster state Hamiltonian some perturbations, basically some additional interactions, uh, which now you know uh, result in finite correlation length. And so these, these additional interactions, uh, we choose to preserve uh, the two Ising symmetries I described before. So they preserve the symmetries that are protecting the SPT state. And thus, the uh, SPT phase survives up to a certain strength of uh, that perturbation, after which it, after which it transitions into some uh, symmetry breaking type state. Okay. So we, we perturb the ideal cluster state, and now we get... Um, we still get non-trivial SPT states. However, away from this fixed point limit, the string order no longer is a, a perfect one value. It'd be some, some order one number that's still finite, okay? And it's easy to, to check that after this exact same measurement and unitary feedback I described on the previous slide, uh, what's left over on the B sublattice is a mixed state 
in which the ZZ correlations uh, precisely take the same value as the string order of the initial peer state. Okay, so there's this same type of measurement feedback will just kill this uh, the, the bulk of the string and leave you with uh, the two-point function. Okay, so just to summarize, after measurement and feedback, uh, after measurement and feedback, we get this long-range GHZ order on the B subsystem. Uh, and once the SBT transitions into a different state, the string order will disappear. And so this long-range order of the mixed state will also disappear. So this mixed state will undergo some transition uh, precisely when the initial pure state undergoes the, the transition. Okay, so this, this mixed state on the B sublattice with long-range ZZ correlation is somewhat unusual because it's, it's a long-range order that's coexisting with extensive entropy. This, uh, this mixed state on the B system is basically, in the purification picture, it's extensively entangled with the A sites. So it has uh, extensive entropy. Um, so yeah, so this is clearly a, a rather, you know, a, a manifestly non-equilibrium state in 1D, right? At, at, at finite temperature, for example, you, you cannot have long range order, right? Um, sorry. Right, okay, but um, however, the, the ZZ correlation by itself uh, is not really a true testament of quantumness, right? You can have uh, purely classical ensembles with long range ZZ correlation, right? So, so how quantum is this mixed state on the B system. So one, uh, one pretty small theorem that we can prove is, is the following. If we have a mixed state in which the two point ZZ function is long range, it's constant as you take I and J apart. And if there's an Ising symmetry intact for this uh, mixed state, then this mixed state cannot be simple in this sense. This mixed state cannot be an ensemble of short range entangled states. Uh, where short range entangled states are defined by any state that you can prepare with a finite depth circuit acting on a product state. Okay, so the, the takeaway is that this long range ZC correlation in conjunction with a global Ising symmetry that anti commutes with the local operators uh, guarantees that this mixed state is quantumly non trivial in, in this precise sense. Okay. All right, so that's. Uh, that's a description of um, yeah that that that's some intuition for uh, what this mixed state uh, in this part of the phase diagram is, and now we want to go to this uh, interesting critical point, right? Because as I said, when the initial peer state becomes critical, uh, this mixed state will also become critical. But how quantum is this uh, critical mixed state, right? So we we can analyze this uh, mixed state at the critical point in uh, a fair amount of detail. We can calculate uh, correlation functions for ZZ operators, and it turns out the same. It, it has the same power law decay as for uh, a pure state Ising conformal field theory. Uh, we can also ca calculate um, string orders, uh, what, what's called disorder parameters. Uh, we can find the power laws, and we find that that actually has twice the power law decay for Ising conformal field theory. And more interestingly, we can compute uh, entanglement measures for this uh, for this mixed state. Right. So here, here we have uh, this critical mixed state rho b. We can partition it into uh, an interval of size x and its complement. And we can ask about uh, the entanglement between this interval and its complement. Right. So uh, as you may know, for, for a mixed state, uh, the, the usual entanglement entropy is no longer a good measure of quantum correlations across this partition because this mixed state is now entangled with some environment. Right. And so the regular entanglement entropy mixes together all those quantum, all those correlations. So we would like a, a measure that's sensitive to only quantum correlations across this partition. And it turns out that uh, the entanglement negativity uh, across this partition does capture the only the quantum correlation. So I, I won't define it right now just uh, to avoid being too technical, but you can think of it as a measure of quantum correlations uh, for a mixed state. And what we find is that uh, this negativity uh, for this critical for this mixed state at criticality has this uh, log scaling with the size of the, the interval. And uh, so it has this universal scaling form that's very typical of uh, conformal field theories. Okay, um, you might know that for uh, uh, a 
pure ground state uh, that describes a conformal field theory, the entanglement entropy also has this log scaling. And the prefactor of that log is uh, proportional to the central charge of the conformal field theory. So here we find that uh, for this critical mixed state, the negativity um, also has the same type of log scaling, uh, but now with a different coefficient. So we, we, we get this data just from um, simple exact diagonalization of this, of this model. And here are the data points corresponding to uh, this, this critical mixed state. And by comparison, here is the negativity for a pure state uh, of a criticalizing model. So as you can see, the, the slope is, uh, is lower than that of the, the pure state CFT. And that's pretty natural from the point of view of uh, monogamy of entanglement, right? So for, for this mixed state, some of the degrees of freedom are now you know, coupled to an environment. So they're, they're less able to participate in long range entanglement within the system. And so this is a somewhat intuitive way to understand why the, the slope is lower than that of a pure CFT. Okay, and once again, this uh, log scaling of negativity is a, is a direct signature of the non-equilibrium nature of the state. Um, some of you might know that for a Gibbs state or equilibrium Gibbs state of a local Hamiltonian, um, such states have a strict uh, area law for entanglement negativity. This is uh, proven, I think, in an appendix in this paper. So the fact that we're getting a, a log scaling uh, is, a, is a direct signature that it's, you know, not, it, it looks nothing like a Gibbs state of a local Hamiltonian. Okay. Is quantity related to the particle state? Uh, yeah, so the, the neg negativity is defined by doing a partial transverse operation on a subsystem. Yeah, I think I have a more explicit formula later that we'll show that, yeah. Okay, so that, that, that's a simple toy example of how measurement feedback can give you interesting mixed states of long range or critical entanglement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I didn't explicitly show that calculation, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it's pr pretty straightforward. Basically, this, this whole measurement and feedback just kills the, the middle of the string. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I can, uh, I can show you more details later, right? Yeah. But yeah, it's a it's a exact calculation. There's no ambiguity. It's, it's literally the same value as the original string order. Yeah. Yes. Uh oh, this this uh this constant here. Oh, that that. No, yeah, he, he, here it's uh, it's non-universal. It's just some some. Oh, that that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I have to think about it. It's a, good, it's a good point. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that, that, that's a very simple example. And, and one can consider uh, more, even more non trivial examples that are motivated by um, the physics of fermion systems and Griesler projection. Right, so in, in condensed matter, there's a, a, a pretty famous um, uh, construction that's called a Gutzler projection, in which you start out with a uh, you start out with a free fermion system, you know, free fermions with both spin up and spin down, and then you project that wave function uh, onto an effective spin wave function by enforcing that uh, the total occupation per side is one. Okay, so you can think of basically the Gutzler projection is doing a forced measurement on a free fermion system in which you enforce that you get measurement outcome one for total occupation number per site. So this gives you a spin wave function, and th this type of spin wave functions can be very interesting. Uh, Grusel projection can give you um, interesting, like critical spin systems, topologically ordered spin systems, etc. A, a whole uh, a whole zoo. And so motivated by that, we want to ask 
what if you start with free fermion systems, but now you do measurement that's not force measurement, right? We, we want this to be physical, achievable in, in a lab, right? So we, we can guarantee measurement outcome, you know, sync, like occupation number one per site, we'll get some random numbers like zero, one, or two. Uh, however, by doing feedback, uh, we can kind of mitigate this, this randomness a bit and, and still get some interesting uh, spin physics arising from it. Okay, so that, that, that motivates uh, this, this next um, set of protocols. Um, yeah, so let me, let me skip the, the 1D example in the interest of time uh, and just go to the, the more interesting um, 2D case. So, so in this example, uh, I'll, I'll show how we can convert uh, an initially gapped pure state uh, with exponentially decaying correlations into a uh, into a critical mixed state. Okay, so the the starting point is a churn insulator in two dimensions. This is basically a, a, a analog of an integer quantum Hall effect. It's it's a it's a insulator in which there's a chiral edge mode at the boundary uh, if if the churn number is one. And so it's a it's a ground state of a gap Hamiltonian. It has exponentially decaying correlation functions. However, um, if one considers a composite operator that, that's obtained by dressing a local fermion operator by some eta operator in which eta is some phase factor that depends on the occupation number everywhere else in the system, uh, weighted by the, the relative angle between those positions and the original position, uh, then this, this dressed operator actually has some interesting power law decay uh, in the churn insulator state. Okay, so basically this, this composite operator that's uh, effectively non-local um, has a, a power law decay in the churn insulator. Okay. So this is kind of mysterious, but it's, it's just the physics of uh, flux attachment. Okay, so the, the cleanest way to see this is to start out with, uh, uh, just consider the, the Laughlin wave function. So Laughlin wave function for the, the lowest lambda level of the integer quantum Hall effect. So this Laughlin wave function is, is given as follows. And basically this type of dressing we're doing is just uh, factoring out a phase factor of the Laughlin wave function uh, that again, depends on the relative position of all the particles, right? And so this, this phase factor that we're extracting from the Laughlin wave function is nothing but the, the first quantized version of this eta operator. Okay. So after factoring out this phase, we get a transformed wave function that's now a, describing a, a system of bosons. Okay. And the system of bosons, one can check, uh, has precisely this type of uh, power law decay, in this case, uh, with power law one half. Okay. So uh, yeah, so all, all this phase factor is doing is uh, basically attaching a statistical flux that depends on the positions of all the particles everywhere. The yeah. Field, uh, or, uh, uh, sorry, what? Field, the, the yeah, side tilde is a bosonic wave function. But the, the operator, the, the one I'm talking. This one is a fermionic wave function because when you interchange two particles, you get minus sign. And C, the, the one C tilde. C tilde. The, 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 the C, not what, what C? Oh, C. C dagger. C, dagger. Oh, C, C tilde dagger. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, okay, that's, yeah, that's a good point. I, it, it's probably a bosonic operator. I, I it, it, it should be, it should be, yeah. Okay. I, to be honest, I haven't checked the explicit computation myself, but it has to be it's based on this picture. Right? It, it shows the coefficient, that's the way it's supposed to be Right, right, yes, yeah. It, it looks like one of those. Jordan, uh, um, <clears throat> Jordan yeah, yeah, it's or 2D bosonization, that's pretty right. much. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the takeaway is just that the churn insulator also has this type of uh, hidden order that depends non locally on the occupation number on all sides. Okay, so now, now we want to again leverage this into some measure, some interesting measurement and feedback protocol. So the, the, the setup is as follows. We want to start with a uh, turn number one state for spin up electrons, a turn number minus one state for uh, spin down electrons. And now we want to measure uh, the total occupation number 
on every site. So, so on, on both systems, just the, the total occupation number per site. So after that, we'll get some string of outcomes for all the sites. And based on that data, we'll apply some unitary feedback. That's just, okay, so sorry. After, after performing these measurements, uh, we get an, an effective spin system on, for, for the whole system. And we can perform some unitary feedback. That's just some phase rotation, some uh, single qubit phase rotation whose phase factor uh, depends on all those measurement outcomes in precisely the, the, the sense I described uh, before. So it's just the, the sum of all occupation numbers weighted by the relative angle. Okay, so uh, the essential physicists were, were using the feedback to kind of build in this eta operator. We're, we're building in this non-trivial phase factor into uh, the, the spin system. Okay, so more, more concretely, uh, we can consider uh, spin operators, um, for example, S plus is just C dagger up, C down. And after applying this unitary feedback, uh, this, this just attaches um, one of these phase factors to the operator. And similarly for, uh, for the S minus operator. Okay. And so, um, I, again, a, a fairly straightforward calculation shows that uh, after this measurement and feedback, you get a mixed state that's effectively defined on a spin system, uh, which has this uh, power law decay that originates from this non-local order of the churn insulator. Okay. So yeah, so this is a pretty interesting example where you know we started off with a gapped pure state, and again with purely local quantum operations, but non-local classical communication, you can get a uh, critical mixed state. Okay. And it's still an open question to understand the entanglement properties of this resulting mixed state. We would like to examine that more. All right, so I, I see I'm running pretty low on time. I'll try to be brief with uh, the, the, the second part. So again, the, the starting point of the second part is very different. Now we want to start out with a, a pure quantum critical state and see what uh, local noise does to it, okay? And this is part of a bigger program of examining what how long range entanglement fares under uh, decoherence, right? And uh, for example, there, there has been a, a very nice recent work from Harvard and Berkeley group in which they look at uh, Tor code under local decoherence and they find interesting connections to the property of the mixed state, like the entanglement negativity, et cetera. Okay, so uh, here's the, the setup for the second part of the talk. Um, again, we're considering an uh, effect of quantum channel uh, on, on a pure state. So again, quantum channel is a general operation that maps uh, mixed states to mixed states. Uh, and here we're dealing with an explicitly local quantum channel, not, not like the first part of the talk. Right? So here the local quantum channel will literally be a tensor product of single qubit uh, channels, single qubit channels. And uh, we'll focus, in fact, on uh, dephasing quantum channels so these quantum channels are defined by either uh, either measuring uh, the qubit in a given direction v uh, with some probability p, or uh, or doing nothing. Okay, that, that's what uh, that's what uh, the dephasing channel does. Um, it would be convenient to define uh, what's called a, a dual channel n star, and this is basically uh, uh, you can think of it as the, the Heisenberg picture for channels. Okay, so the, the original channel N acts on the state rho, right? Uh, but the dual channel acts on operators and it's just defined to reproduce all the right expectation values, just, just like the, the usual Heisenberg picture, okay? So for example, um, say you want to apply a dephasing in the Z direction with some strength P, uh, one can check that the dual channel uh, maps the Pauli operators to, to these, so it just, suppresses the X and Y Pauli operators by a factor one minus P, and it keeps the Z operator uh, unchanged. Okay. okay, so now we want to apply this type of you know, simple local quantum channel uh, to uh, an interesting critical state, critical pure state described by a uh, conformal field theory. Okay. And we want to look at the properties of this resulting mixed state. So uh, one, one, one thing we can say is that we can map these channels n into boundary conditions of uh, several copies of this conformal field theory. Okay, so let, let me uh, give you a taste of that, of why that's true. So say you want to compute uh, some property of the, the mixed state rho, like say the, a, a Rennie entropy of a subsystem for rho. 
So this is defined by just um, you know log trace uh, reduced density matrix to the power n. Um, so for this, we can use uh, um, standard techniques. So we can uh, write this trace related to the n as just uh, expectation value of a permutation operator of n replicas in uh, n copies of the state row. Okay. So some of you might be familiar with the a Rennie two calculation in which uh, the, you know the permutation operator reduces the swap operator, right? Okay, so now we can uh, okay we just plug in uh, row being a channel applied to the the state, and now we can uh, move the action of the channel onto a dual action acting on the permutation operator. So now we get the expectation value of some operator B that's defined by uh, the dual channel acting on the permutation operator. And expectation value taken in the original in n copies of the original critical state. Okay, and finally we can uh, map operators into uh, states on a double Hilbert space, and so this whole thing reduces to some wave function overlap of uh, effectively two n copies of the conformal field theory on on one part of the overlap and this uh, operator state B on the other end. So the, the picture for this calculation now looks like uh, two n copies of the CFT overlap with uh, this boundary condition, which depends on the channel n that was applied. Okay, so th this is how channels turn into uh, boundary conditions for CFT. Okay, and this this applies to all sorts of uh, entanglement measures you're interested in. For example, um, again, we might be interested in entanglement negativity. It's a good mixed state measure. And integral neg negativity um, is defined by taking uh, a partial transpose of the density matrix on the A subsystem and then taking the nth power. And all this maps to some generalized boundary conditions. Okay. So, so again, we have very similar pictures of several copies of the CFT overlap with some boundary condition uh, depending on the quantum channel that was applied. Okay. So now this is the, 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 the upshot is that to ask, you know, um, what are the properties of this resulting mixed state? Now that maps into the question of, of what what do these boundary conditions flow to you in the IR limit of the CFT, right? Uh, what conformal boundary conditions do, do these all flow to you? Right? So that's how we can define an RG flow for uh, for for quantum channels. So let me be uh, uh, more concrete about these. So let, let's start out with the a, a simplest thing to ask for this mixed state row. Just what, what's the, the entropy of row? Um, more specifically, what's the, the second Rennie entropy of the entire row state? Okay, so no, no partition or anything, just what, what's the entropy of it? So that, that's just uh, negative log trace row squared. And so what we find is that uh, there's a extensive part of the entropy that just scales with the system size. This is natural because, because every qubit is being defased a little bit, right? And uh, the more interesting thing is this uh, universal subleading part, this log G, which depends on the channel that was applied. And uh, this log G is nothing but what's called the affleck ludwig boundary entropy in the conformal field theory. Okay, so um, I don't want to go into too much detail. Let me just point out that um, this G function uh, plays a similar role for um, understanding the RG flow of the boundary as the central charge C does for the bulk RG flow of the conformal field theory. Okay. And more, more precisely, uh, it, it dictates which channels can flow under RG to, to which other channels. So a channel with larger G can flow to a channel with smaller G, uh, but not vice versa. Okay. And sorry, I should probably clarify what I mean by flow. So by, by flow, we're basically looking at uh, the long distance or on the limit of the system and looking at the universal properties in, in that limit. Okay. okay, so let's see what happens for um, one of the simplest critical states, that's just the, the critical transitionalizing model in 1D. Okay, so we're interested in the, the ground state of this uh, 1D spin chain model. And uh, we've chosen a convention where the interaction is uh, xx and the local field is, is z. So what we find is the, the following RG flows for, for quantum channels. So uh, yeah, let, let me explain this uh, in detail. So here, um, if you consider applying dephasing in the z direction, uh, we find that 
it corresponds to a, uh, a marginal perturbation. And this leads to a continuous set of uh, fixed points. Okay, so what, what this means is that for every strength of the phasing in the z direction, we get a, a different uh, fixed point of the conformal boundary condition. Okay, so, so the phasing in the z direction always gives uh, log g equals zero, and it gives you this uh, continuous family. On the other hand, uh, defacing in the x direction is a, is a relevant perturbation. It has log g equals minus log two. And that means if you uh, do a arbitrarily small amount of defacing in the x direction, then you'll flow to complete defacing in the x direction. Okay, that, that's what the, the value of uh, relevant perturbation means. And finally, if you consider uh, defacing in uh, the zx plane, uh, we find that that's even, even more relevant as log g equals minus two log two. And so all these channels, when weakly perturbed in this direction, will end up flowing toward that. Okay, so we obtain this type of RG flow diagram by, by just numerically computing uh, this G function um, for different system sizes. And we can see that uh, for bigger and bigger system size, they flow to a particular value, like in this case, uh, minus two log two. Okay. Okay, so th these are uh, some of the RG flows for defacing channels applied to uh, this criticalizing ground state. So um, yeah, let, let me skip this in the interest of time too. Basically with, with these CFT techniques, we can compute uh, many quantities of interest. We can compute uh, mutual information between intervals um, you know, that are both A and its complement or two disjoint intervals. Uh, we can compute a lot of stuff. Um, however, to me, the most interesting thing is uh, again, the, the integument negativity results. Because again, th this is like a, a measure of how quantum uh, are the, the resulting mixed states one gets, right? And so let me uh, show you the results here. So just to remind you, we're, we're partitioning the mixed state into A and A bar and computing the integument negativity between A and A bar, the, the amount of quantum correlation between A and A bar. So when we apply the defacing in the X direction, uh, recall that the RG flow indicated that that was a, a relevant perturbation, right? And that uh, a small amount of X defacing should flow to complete defacing. And complete the phasing gives you a completely classical state, right? And the completely classical state has zero negativity. And indeed, that's consistent with what we find before the integument negativity of this, of this X to phase state. You can see that, okay, so here's the original uh, critical pure state with log scaling of negativity. But even for a, a very small strength of the phasing in the X direction, uh, this log scaling becomes area law pretty much immediately. Right. So this is consistent with the fact that this is a relevant perturbation that immediately in the IR flows to a completely classical state. Okay. And this is uh, somewhat counterintuitive because um, for, for finite P, like 0.1 or 0.2, uh, the resulting mixed states actually have, they still have power law decaying uh, ZZ and XX correlation functions. So based on correlation functions alone, they would appear uh, quantum, right? And yet, this more uh, precise negativity calculation shows that they're actually classical in the IR limit. Okay, so yeah, we, so we still, we still need to wrap our head around this, but I just want to point out it's somewhat uh, counterintuitive. When you say the resultant state, you mean the the, the the fixed point state in the long time of the dynamic state. Well, okay, so sorry. So the, the dynamics here is just a, a single shot dynamics. We're just applying one layer of quantum channel with strength P to a given critical pure state. Yeah, so uh, so the, 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 the RG flow, I mean, is like an RG flow for the, making the space direction very big. Okay. We're interested in the properties for large L, right? Yeah. Okay, and... Uh, and now we can consider the, the zeta phasing. So just to remind you, the RG flow on the previous slide indicated that it was a marginal perturbation. And indeed, again, that's consistent with what we find with integument negativity. So here are the negativities for different value, different strengths of P to phasing in the Z direction. And you can see that the, the slope uh, changes continuously uh, with P. Uh, again, consistent with the idea that you have a continuous family of, of fixed points. The defacing in the y direction also turns out to be quite interesting. Um, here we find that 
at least for p uh, below some threshold value of around 0.6 or 0.6 or 0.7, uh, the y dephasing turns out to be irrelevant. And what this means in terms of negativity is that if you look at the, the log scaling of negativity, uh, even the slope of that log scaling doesn't change. Okay, the, the slope of the, of the log scaling is the same as the original pure state CFT. So this is, uh, again, somewhat counterintuitive. Basically, the, the y dephasing for, for p you know, less than 0.6 flows back to the original uh, peer state properties. Okay. Okay, so um, that's pretty much um, all the results I want to present. Uh, let me just conclude with some, uh, some open questions that we're, we're interested in. Obviously, uh, experiments would be nice for, for all these setups, right? And indeed, these uh, mid-circuit measurements, these adaptive circuits are uh, quite realistic. So in fact, we, we recently collaborated with uh, Quantidium, which is one of the trapped ion quantum computing groups, and also um, Isaac Kim at Davis and his student uh, Arkin Piku, uh, to basically carry out some simple uh, uh, adaptive circuit to prepare a, a Tora code state. Okay, so these adaptive circuits are very realistic in several platforms now. Um, this occupation number measurements are pretty realistic for uh, optical lattices. So it'd be interesting to carry out these uh, Gutzler motivated protocols I, I mentioned there. And, and finally, for the second part, um, uh, a lot of these entropies, negativities uh, can be probed with um, these fairly recent shadow topography methods on uh, quantum simulators. Conceptually, it'd be interesting to further um, understand the constraints for lo local adaptive protocols, right? So they, they can beat local unitary circuits, they're more efficient, but they can't do everything, right? So uh, exactly what can or cannot they do? We'd like to understand that, that in more detail. And finally, uh, this is related to the, the last question. Um, so, you know, I, I showed you basically single shot type dynamics, like, you know, like just one layer of, of, of operations. But it would be interesting to consider, uh, you know, local adaptive dynamics in which you're iterating measurement and feedback, measurement and feedback over and over. And indeed, there have been some recent works considering uh, measurement and feedback, but with local feedback, right? With local feedback in which the operations you apply depend only on the measurements that are performed before but near that site. Okay. And uh, in those cases, they found that the, the resulting you can get some mixed state transitions, but those are, are classical in many sense. Like you wouldn't expect like log scaling of negativity, for example. And so uh, the this, this type of non-local feedback in, in the first part of the talk, I think is really essential to being able to stabilize long range entanglement in, in the mixed state. But uh, we, we still need to think about what interesting dynamical protocols there are. Okay, so let me just uh, conclude with a, a summary slide. So in, in the first part, I showed you how uh, measurement feedback gives rise to non-local quantum channels that convert simple pure states into uh, long range or critical mixed states. Uh, and one uh, interesting example is starting out with a gapped pure state churn insulator, getting a critical mixed state on the resulting spin system. And in the second part, uh, we un understood the effects of local noise on quantum critical points. Uh, we mapped channels to boundary conditions of CFT which allow us to compute uh, RG flows for these channels. And these uh, help us understand the entanglement structure of uh, the resulting mixed states. Okay, so uh, I've, I hope I've convinced you that uh, noise mixing things up uh, is not always a, a bad thing and can actually uh, enrich the physics. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>